Uh, so in our uh, series, uh, we had decided that we would talk about uh, high tunnel and greenhouses and what the difference is. And uh, the biggest difference is literally in the name. Uh, Gothic High Tunnel House is somewhat of a new development in farming. It's similar to a, to a standard greenhouse, except it's lighter, it's more flexible. You can actually take it down, put it back together, move it somewhere else, and you know do more with it. The, one of the biggest things about a high tunnel house is uh, it's planted directly in the ground instead of up in raised beds like a traditional greenhouse. And it's big enough that it can, you can actually bring a tractor in with a tiller um, or a specific kind of, of harvesting device that, that pulls the uh, plants out of the ground. They are also basically covered with a very simple film membrane, uh, generally between six and 12 mils thick. And as the season warms up, you can take that off and just let it be exposed to the natural elements. Now the whole premise of this was to simply extend the growing season uh, a few weeks in each direction. So you can plant some uh, plants early in the year that you maybe not pass the last frost date and this house will, will let the, the sun come through and warm the earth and keep the frost off of them, get the plants a head start, get you farther along in crop development. And at the same time, in the, at the end of the year, you can have a maybe a second or third crop in and uh, the, the cool evenings of, of November have started to, to show up and you've got the, you put the plastic back on, roll the sides down. Now, you can make these as simple as you want, which is the picture we've got here in front of us. This is just roll up sides and uh, uh, open span, or you can make it very complicated. You can add furnaces to them, you can add, uh, ventilators on the sides, you can add automatic roll up and you can add irrigation. You can see the irrigation on the, the plants on the ground, which I believe these are all tomatoes. And uh, it is truly up to your heart's desire, but the whole the big thing about it is it is uh, completely uh, removable. Uh, so the benefits farm, found by farmers, as you can see in our circle wheel there is early spring, we get a longer growing season. Summer, we take the film off late, late fall we put the film back on and then just over the winter we're not really worried about trying to uh, keep something over winter it's uh, typically not a year-round uh, building now uh, you'll get people that will say well I, I put two skins on it put air in it that's that part where you're getting into the much more complicated I'm simply talking about a standard uh, high tunnel house that has one membrane of plastic on it um, it just is that early spring and late fall. Uh, this is a traditional greenhouse. A finished floor of some sort, glass, polycarbonate, uh, pretty heavy structure. You've got obviously a lot of shelving, plants are on it, fixed lighting. If you are ever in a traditional greenhouse, if, you, if, if it's quiet enough and you stand there long enough, you'll hear all of the motors working with vents that keep the humidity and the temperature the right, you know, the vents will open to let heat out and they'll close to keep heat in. Uh, they're, they're very automated, they're very uh, complicated, and they do lots of things. This is another traditional greenhouse. They can be huge. Uh, you go on the interstate, you can see if them go online and, and look at some of the ones up in Canada, they, they are just massive uh, greenhouses and um, they, they utilize a lot of resources to make them work and they are not portable at all. This is the difference. On the right hand side is a greenhouse, obviously lots of work involved to it. The left hand side is a Gothic high tunnel house. It's a bunch of cold rolled tubes, some plastic and a couple pieces of wood. Uh, most people can put one up in a weekend, take it down in a weekend and move it. Uh, that's. Uh, and that may be that particular farmer's uh, idea of getting started for the season. He takes it down and moves it to another field uh, for the fall. And there's a picture of our, of our uh, tractor coming in. And uh, that's the entire idea. He's uh, gonna come in and, and do some, some work with the whole tractor instead of having to do stuff by hand in raised beds. So 
cost differential is huge, and I do mean huge. Um, the Hamilton Conservation Corps was the recipient of a uh, NRCS grant for a high tunnel house. It's, set, it's 30 feet long and 72 feet wide. The, uh, the high tunnel house was $7,700. That's 2,100 feet of growing space. The same traditional greenhouse cost is approximately $54,000. That is a, an unbelievable change in price. Now, that being said, you can also add a furnace, which is another you know, $3,000. You can add ventilators, which is another two or $3,000. You can add automated roll up sides. You can add a second skin. You can add a ventilator. Now you start seeing where all that money comes from. It's in all of the automation and all of the environmental controls that you're adding to the high tunnel house. And when you do that, you're typically turning it into more of a traditional greenhouse. Uh, so in reality, uh, the high tunnel house is the new big tool in the shed and it is the shed. It's flexible, it's scalable, mobile. Uh, it doesn't cost a lot of money and it's a uh, low manpower needs because you're planting stuff in the ground with a tractor and you're done. That's, uh, that's really it. Uh, any questions about high tunnel houses? Uh, we have, we're, we're hoping to get ours put up here in the next uh, couple of months and hopefully in one of our next um, uh, seminars, we'll be able to, to take one of the computers that has a camera, we can walk, walk through it and show you a little bit better. Um, to give you an idea of that 72 foot long by 30 foot wide greenhouse that's 14 feet tall came on two 10 by 10 or 10 foot long regular width skids, just two. That's all it took. Um, so, our next speaker is going to be Kathy, and she's going to be talking about trees for bees and um, a, a few resources that she just shared with me that I'll put in the, the chat box um, while she's doing her thing. But I am going to mute myself and let Kathy do her thing. Good evening, thanks for joining us. I'm gonna be talking about trees and pollinators. And um, so native makes it taste good. Uh, and the reason that that is, is because um, obviously the, tr the insects that we are trying to attract grew up here, they evolved here. These are the plants that they are used to eating. So that's why they, they like the natives. Um, wildlife, birds, bees, butterflies, moths, they all evolve eating the native plants that are here. Most of our native plant eaters are not able to eat alien plants. And yeah, that sounds like a strange thing to call them, but that's what they are. They are alien plants. Um, so that's why we need to try to plant natives. Uh, just because it's the same species doesn't mean that it's the same. It doesn't taste the same. It doesn't provide the same nutrition. Uh, so while you may think that planting a Japanese maple tree is a maple tree is a maple tree, it isn't. It, it, it does not have the same nutrients. It doesn't taste the same to the insects that uh, are going to be nesting on it and, and eating it. Uh, a ginkgo tree is not the same as an, as an oak. So we're going to start talking about some specific trees. I think that that's a, um, a good place to head with this. All right. We're going to talk about dogwoods. Actually, until I started researching this, I didn't realize that there were Japanese dogwoods that were here in the United States. So we're not always getting the, the native plant. Um, to make a commitment to buy natives uh, and, and to try to make sure that you keep native plants on your property and in your gardens, it really does take some work. You really have to look at it uh, and, and research as to whether or not these are native or whether they're cultivars or whether they're something that got shipped in from a, a, another country. Um, the flowering dogwood can be either white or pink. Uh, it, the, the absolute native for the United States is the Cornus floridia. Um, the native species have opposite leaves and their veins run along the leaf, uh, the leaf margins. Some pollinators that frequent dogwoods are the spring azure, uh, this little teeny tiny blue guy, 
he is about the size of a fingernail. Uh, I tried to catch a picture of one of these for hours one time, and they're just so small and they flip so fast, it's really hard to do. The other, another one is the um, Cecropia moss, and that is about the size of your hand. And I just about had a fit. A couple of weeks ago, I was sitting on my deck, and sure as heck, one of those big boogers flew right in front of my face. He flew up into my Crimson King maple, and I don't know where he went from there. Uh, so we've got the very tiny, tiny of the guys, and we got really good sized guys. Um, dogwood berries have high calcium and fat content, so those are very good for your birds as well. Um, several bees visit the dogwoods, and uh, most of them are mining bees. You heard JT talk about the mining bees before. Mining bees love your, love your, uh, your dogwoods in the spring. Our next tree we're going to talk about are red buds. Uh, the red bud is a great plant for both sunlight and shade. Uh, it, they, it proves itself to be adaptable to both light conditions. The red bud and the dogwood are great understory trees as well. Whenever you see them out in the forest, normally they are understory, which means they're shorter than all the big tall canopy trees. Um, the, uh, the red bud is a great pollinator. Uh, it blooms from March until May. Uh, it's one of those important early pollinator plants. According to Xerces, it holds particular value to native long tongue bees. Uh, and those are minor bees, leaf cutting bees, and the carpenter bees. This tree also plays host to tons of caterpillars and insect lar larvae that, that munch on the leaves. Uh, this tree is a fantastic substitute for uh, the non-native cherry trees. We like those flowering cherries and the flowering crab trees because um, they have those nice pink blooms. This is really a better uh, replacement for that because it's native. Uh, if you watch those Japanese um, maples and the flowering crabs, you're not going to see as many pollinators on there because they're alien food to them. Uh, I particularly love the heart-shaped leaves. Uh, another name for this is forest pansy. We've actually had a couple of these at our house and our leaves are actually purple uh, and then they turn a beautiful gold in the fall. The foliage and, and, and the, the blooms on this, it's just one of those pretty trees all year long. Um, we, talked about, we talked about it being a great understory tree. We're going to talk about an oak tree. Um, there are 11 different species of oaks native to Ohio. Lynn is going to give you uh, a link to a tree book. Uh, it's one of our field guides. I don't know if you guys can see this or not, okay? Uh, and it's got all the different, a bunch of different trees in here. It's got all the different species of the oak trees that I'm gonna be talking about as well. Uh, native, works, uh, native oaks, not works, this is not Lord of the Rings, uh, support pollinators throughout the year. Uh, but especially they provide winter shelter for a lot of things that, that uh, leave their larvae and stuff on those, on those trees. Uh, native oaks give uh, more than 500 pollinator species uh, their, their, uh, their, the, their food sources. Um, insects and caterpillars are the basis of all the wild uh, ecosystems. Um, as contrast to, I mentioned the ginkgo tree before, it can, it can support about six different pollinators, whereas the oak tree support 500 different pollinators. I've got some different, so, um, so these are the different, this is a pin oak, this is a bur oak, and this is a swamp white oak. So uh, they're, they're basically white oaks and there are red oaks. They like different sorts of uh, soil. So if you've got if you've got sandy soil, you can find an oak tree that will live in it. If you've got a dense soil, you can also find it an oak tree that will live in it. Um, with eleven different species, there's a lot of diversity there for you to be able to find something to grow in your yard. Maples. Uh, we have a ton of different ma maples in the United States. Uh, the three species that are found in Ohio are the silver maple, the red maple, and the sugar maple. Uh, all of these trees are ideal shade trees. They all have sap. They all have different pollinators that love to be on them. Uh, this is, 
There are inchworms that like to be on them. Uh, red maples will tolerate a variety of growing conditions, but they prefer moist woodlands and deep acidic soils. Red maples are known colloquially as swamp maples. So that's where you get that they like that wet soil. Um, they can, because they can thrive, thrive in their damp conditions. Sugar maples are slow growing. They have dense, finely grained wood that is most valuable for logging, which we don't really want to do a lot of logging right now. We want to save our trees. Maples support a wide variety of uh, forest-loving butterflies, inchworms, and this is a retarded dagger moth. Uh, I, I know that JT talked about butter, uh, bees and wasps. Um, moths are, are also very important pollinators and uh, have a tendency to spend more time on trees than they do on flowers, like we see the butterflies. Black cherries and native cherries. Uh, native wild cherries, including the black, they include black cherries, choke cherries, and pin cherries. Uh, they're excellent food sources for wildlife. Native cherry trees rank third in the number of butterflies that it supports on its foliage. Um, they have a beautiful, really rough bark. Uh, this is a black cherry that is growing. If they don't have the whole, the really straight trunks, they have more of the, the gnarly kind of trunks. This down here in the lower right hand corner is the blossom uh, or, or the, uh, the bloom that you'll see in the spring. We have some of these on our property and they were covered with butterflies and bees and stuff in the early spring. Two of the species that like to live on your black cherries are the tiger swallowtails and the uh, red, the purple red butterfly, um, which it has no purple and it has no red. It has blue and orange, but that's what they call it. Um, native species, uh, cherries will support 10 different species of giant silk moths, five species of butterflies, 63 species of inchworms, 18 species of dagger moths, uh, plus the food, the fruit uh, is a phenomenal food source for all of your birds all year long. Black cherries like uh, a, a rich soil. They are a canopy tree. Birch. Um, the three kind of birch that are native to the state of Ohio is black birch, river birch, and yellow birch. Uh, the genus Butola includes dozens of Asian, European, and American species. Um, so you want to make sure, once again, that you're finding those birch trees that are native to the United States. Uh, there are lots of different kind of birches that have been imported. They're beautiful trees, but they do not benefit our pollinators. Birch trees uh, do not rely on insect pollination. Uh, they, they actually are pollinated by the wind, um, but the pollinators still like to frequent them. Uh, they're a key source of habitat for, for insects. Um, they're, because of their, their, uh, malt, their bark having, being peeling, there are lots and lots of insects and stuff that like to live underneath that bark. So it's a, 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 very, a very good source for um, shelter for the insects. They, uh, they have a good food source for their leaves are estimated 413 species of butterflies and moths will live on them. Birch trees have deep throat and peeling bark, which, we, which I just read, uh, referred to. The caterpillars like to hide under there because the predators don't find them. Uh, this river birch is much older and larger than most river birches. Uh, and um, whenever you look high up in those trees, you'll see uh, the, the beautiful bark that's up in there. I know I talked really fast on these. From uh, Lynn is going to share a link to the Bringing Nature Home book that I used mostly for this lecture. The author is Doug Tallamy. Uh, he's an a, absolutely fantastic author. Um, and I, I took this from his book. If you look at this, it will tell you how many species are supported according to which tree. Um, and these are the native trees we're talking about. So your oak tree will, will, will do over 500 species. 
even the tree all the way down the bottom, the chestnut, it supports 125 different pollinators, um, lepidopteras, uh, well, it, it, with its species. Um, any questions that you guys might have? I know I kind of sped through that. Uh, our resources are, uh, Lynn will put up. And I think that is just about it for me. Lynn, are you out there? Oh, stop share. I got lost. Am I on? Yep, I'm out here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I had to run from, I'm using a different computer to type in the chat box. So I just shared the book that, um, that Kathy just mentioned by Doug Tallamy and also the um, Trees of Ohio Field Guide from ODNR. Um, Ohio State Extension also has a ton of amazing resources and it, the Xerces Society also has a lot of resources whenever it comes to pollinators. Um, X-E-R-C-E-S. Xerces. Oh, yeah. Let me, I'll type that one in as well. Um, but I'll put the list of resources on the, um, on the website as well. Um, again, I'm going to post everything on the Butler swcd.org website, which I just posted, and I'll get their Xerxes Society, and whoops, I'll share their website too. Um, so we rearranged the schedule, um, as you may have noticed. We were going to have um, the pollinator pest tonight, and we were going to have the planting um, seeds tonight. We had to rearrange the schedule a bit. So those are both going to be in September um, along with butterflies, uh, moths and skippers, and um, host plants for caterpillars. So there's four topics on the September date. Um, I do want to go outside the building though and hopefully some of you will be able to see and hopefully it's not chucking it down with rain, but come outside, Troy, because you're handy. I'm actually in the same building as Kathy and Troy just now. I'm actually down in their building. Um, so I'm hoping you can see the mural on the outside of their building. But if you're down in Joyce Park, um, next to Wake Nation, um, their building is right next to that, and it's, um, they've been developing it as a nature center. Um, but the mural is just, it's awesome for the topic of what we're doing just now, doing the pollinators. So, walking back in again. But yeah, so, sorry tonight is a little bit abbreviated, but, um, oh, somebody said pretty mural. <laughs> um, but yep, yeah, so sorry tonight is a bit abbreviated. Um, we will be going, it looks like with everything that's scheduled for September, it will be the full two hours. Um, I'm good, thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks for having us, everybody. See y'all later. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, thanks. And I guess we're signing off. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.